Greetings, fellow constant readers. You're listening to, or perhaps you're watching, the Company of the Mad, The Stand podcast. I cannot believe it, but we have come to the end of our journey, Katet. Today we will be discussing chapters 71 through the end of Stephen King's epic novel, The Stand. I am joined as I have been since the first episode, by three people who are so incredibly special to me. Six episodes and 1,153 pages later, it is my honor to not only refer to them as my distinguished panel, but to call them my friends. Making new friends is not an easy task during a pandemic. We stay home, we stay safe, and we socially distance. So to meet three like-minded souls to walk with through King's post-pandemic America has been the most beautiful surprise and one that I will always cherish. Mike Flanagan is with us, writer and director of such Stephen King adaptations as Gerald's Game and Dr. Sleep. You can watch his latest project, The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix, where he has a new series, Midnight Mass, soon to come. Tanana Reeve Dew, is a novelist and the producer of Shudder's Horror Noir, a history of black horror. She also teaches black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA, and you can take her online digital download course, The Sunken Place, by going to tananarivedu.com. Anthony Bresnikin is a novelist and journalist who has worked as a reporter for the Arizona Republic, Associated Press, USA Today, and Entertainment Weekly. He is the Los Angeles correspondent for Vanity Fair. I'm your host, Jason Seacrest. I write scary stuff. I write about scary stuff, too. And I write a column for Stephen King's limited edition publishers called What I Learned from Stephen King, exploring the wisdom, life lessons, and spirituality in King's many works. You can hear me read those columns to you, read all of my horror fiction, and get bonus podcast episodes where I ramble on for hours when you subscribe at patreon.com slash Jason Seacrest. You can find a link to that Patreon page and also to Tanana Reeve Dew's online course, all these things and more at thestandpodcast.com. In the final pages of The Stand, there's so much packed in to these last, it's a little less than 200 pages. Uh, we have Stu left behind as the others go forth unto Vegas. We have what looks like a public execution in the making and the return of the trash can man. I want to start today's discussion with Mike because I know that Mike had things to say about these chapters last month and we were like, no, 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 Mike, we can't talk about that yet because those aren't the pages. So now that we're here, I just want to know, Mike, how did the final showdown, how did the, the final chapters of The Stand grab you? And was there anything in particular that you felt was was relevant to what we're seeing in the world today? Well, I, I think that's kind of the, the most striking thing to me is that when when the four of us first started having these conversations about the early chapters of The Stand, it was at the beginning of a global pandemic um, that we didn't truly understand yet and the scope of which was still largely mysterious to us. Um, and there was this sense of kind of a, a creepy unreality to it where the events of the book that seemed to, uh, in any other previous you know read would have seemed to be suspension of disbelief and, and seemed to be kind of out there, felt uncomfortably familiar, you know? Um, but it was all kind of within the context of Captain Trips and of of the the science of of this pandemic that we have found ourselves in as a planet. And so, as we finish this journey, we're we're finishing it with all of these scenes in Vegas where you've got a man who's risen to power on fear, um, kept his supporters in line with conspiracy theories and the demonization of their fellow American citizens, um, whose empire is starting to crumble as it kind of devours itself and as his once loyal followers are beginning to have second thoughts and doubts and are questioning him and he's turning on them. Um, 
and like you said, there, there's this specter of this mob that's gathering for public executions. And then you we're like looking over at, at, at the news and we're seeing gallows outside of, of the Capitol and people chanting, hang Mike Pence. And once again, I, I feel like we four have had this very strange, uh, I don't know if anyone will ever read the stand the way the people who have read the stand this calendar year um, will have experienced it because it's so uncanny and there's so much um, of the the wisdom of Stephen King about human nature that comes out of this because it's not you know it, it's not prophecy he he he's not you know Nostradamus trying to make predictions about the future he's he's drawing from repeated and observable traits within humankind and human societies and playing those equations out. Repeated and, and observable, I, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of what's so striking. There's this, this moment toward the end of this, you know, other than there's so many fantastic scenes we should discuss individually as we go. We've got to talk about, you know, uh, about Stuart's struggle all alone and and reuniting with Tom, and we have to talk about Lloyd, who, whose journey is so fascinating, and we have to talk about uh, Glenn's death scene, which is incredible. Um, but the, the moment that struck me the most was when all of Flag's acolytes are assembled in Vegas, and when the true scope and, uh, of what he's trying to do is kind of laid bare, and you can't make excuses for it anymore. And the conspiracy theories about the Boulder Free Zone have already kind of proven to be false, but people hang on to them anyway. And it really is this man is going to gleefully ask other people to kill uh, these other um, Americans for their entertainment, really. Um, and someone finally stands up and says, no, you know, and, and, and says out loud, we're, we're Americans. And, and I thought that was what kind of really struck me was was the specific allusion to what Americans do and do not do to each other, um, and how that in this story had been completely corrupted and completely fallen apart, and that even within the ranks of people who had been really programmed and, and whose base hates and, and worst instincts had been fed and stoked by Randall Flagg, how there was still a voice of reason that came from the people at the end there protesting it, and that he turned around and it's, it's one of the most grotesque kind of physical mutilations that, that you see in this portion of the, of the book where his mouth fuses shut. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I just found all of this to be really chilling and all of it to be really sad and, um, and unimaginably relevant to where we are. And, and you know, today, as we record this, it's Sunday, um, the FBI has said all week that there's an unprecedented amount of chatter from domestic terrorist organizations who are planning organized violent demonstrations in every state of the union uh, for the next few days leading up to the inauguration and possibly beyond. And then, you know, the question beyond that is, and it's not like it's all going to go away. It's not like the inauguration happens and everyone packs up their stuff and goes home and we don't have to worry about this anymore or all the divisions are healed, you know, which I think in context of the end of the stand is fascinating, the cycle, um, the circle opening and closing. And, and I, I, I think, you know, regardless of the other things I'm thrilled to discuss and really want to hear everybody's opinions on like the, the ultimate deus ex machina here, the hand of God that comes down, which I have strong opinions about as, as the good little atheist that I am. <laughs> um, but uh, aside from all, the, all the, the book club conversation that we should be having, um, it almost knocked me over just what, what an intense experience it is to read this parable about human nature and about human society um, at a time when all of its various theses are are being demonstrated for us in real time in real life down to the virus it's fucking spooky yeah. and um i don't know i found it to be a bit emotionally overwhelming uh in finishing it so yeah, yeah. i i think well said, you, man well said very well said. very well said yeah and you you mentioned um you know 
it's it's funny the thing that that really um you just said a lot of really brilliant things there that deserve a lot of unpacking but the thing that i latched onto the most was the repeated and observable part because the reason why i i kept thinking of that is that um you know obviously i have to preface this by saying there's never been a year like 2020 there has never been a year like 2020 and you know obviously we always think about how much this novel mirrors what it is that we saw going on throughout america last year but it did make me wonder um i thought what was going on in the world when king was writing the stand and i did a little bit of digging and it struck me that in the months following the publication of the shining in 1977, right around the time that he would have been either starting this or already was a little bit into it even. Um, gas prices were at an all-time high. You had inflation. There were random terrorist attacks that were happening in the world during those months. There was a disease called Legionnaire's disease that um, was wiping out nearly three dozen people in a Philadelphia hotel. And there was, of course, the 24-hour blackout in New York that resulted in riots and looting. And it just struck me. It's just the cycle. It just struck me. It was just like, it's not, I actually think that the stand is more relevant now than it was even at the time that he wrote it. But I was just curious to see, you know, if there were any similarities. And like you said, it's, there are certain elements of it that are repeated and observable and sort of like the tweet that King, you know, sent at, at one point saying it all, it all kind of comes back around. It's, um, which is disheartening, um, but there's also some hope there that I'll get into a little bit later in the episode. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, it's repeated and observable for I sure. I think it, it's only fitting that we broaden our usual book club conversation to the experience of doing this podcast while reading this book because our listeners and viewers have been doing the same thing. And... For me, I listened to the audio version. Mm. So for me, it was always bound to my evening walks, which I, I was getting stir crazy early in the pandemic, realized that the outdoors needed to be another room in my house. <laughs> so I started walking and listening to audio. And at the beginning of the pandemic, it was the uncertainty that like during the time when the toilet paper was off the shelves, like what the hell is going on? Will there be meat? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know what's going on. So there was this weird fearfulness, like walking through a ghost town at night. And a lot of that dread was about not knowing the future. And then as the time went on, it became more about the politics of anybody I might encounter. If there's a pickup driving past with a big flag flying, I feel scared. Right. So I was always I'm always scared on my walks, which is perfect, I guess, for listening to horror. I, I carry a big flashlight that can also double as a baton. All right. So I, I literally arm myself to take a nightly walk because I don't know. I don't know what this guy driving this truck is thinking about. I don't know who any of my neighbors voted for. There are no signs in my yard. And I don't know which of those voters feel like this election was being stolen um, I don't know which one in three people in LA County I'm going to encounter that might have this virus at this point, which is the statistic, one in three in the county. So um, yeah, the actual fearful state of experiencing the book <laughs> while reading the book is something I will never forget. And unfortunately, I have to say that I feel like the people in Las Vegas started to wake up faster than the people we may encounter in our world, you know, because Flag was making some pretty highfalutin claims and had built himself up and he was starting to look like the man behind the curtain to some of these folks pretty early on. Whereas, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how long it'll take for a huge percentage of the population to also realize that they had a man behind the curtain, that there was no Oz. Mm. Wow. They were <sighs> yeah. That uh, last time we talked about, uh, I think I mentioned Harold. Uh, was Harold's death a part of that conversation? Did I leap ahead? Yes. No, 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 no. It was. Well, yeah. Um, but since then, I don't know if you guys saw this guy, Brad Ruxdales. He was a CEO of some company who was caught at the Capitol. And he put out this statement and it was like, 
in a moment of extremely poor judgment following the January 6th rally. My decision to enter the Capitol was wrong. I am deeply regretful to have done so. Without qualification and as a peaceful and law-abiding citizen, I condemn the violence and destruction that took place. I offer my sincere apologies. I expect this to be signed Hawk. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what, he didn't say I was misled. I, I was, was misled. misled. <laughs> it, but like, I feel like it was implied. <clears throat> you know, I did this of my own free will. Like, um, it just feels like people once they get really trapped and they personally suffer the consequences, then they go, "Why did I do that?" Mm. You know. But also, that's another part of human nature right, is that we do things and then we look back and go, what was wrong with me? What was I thinking? Uh, you know, and hopefully we're better people as a result of it. But I wonder if that's gonna happen with the folks who believe these conspiracies, if they go, why did I ever think a pizza place with some headquarters for some satanic ring? Like, why did <laughs> I do that? Like, and it makes you wonder, like, like well, why would you believe it now, right? But but something, it is easy. We are we are able to be glamored, you know, as human beings. We we we're in our time and place, and in our cohort, and among our friends and people we trust. And if we hear things that sound plausible, it can worm its way into our brains, and it takes a lot to change. You know, it takes a lot to evolve. It does. It does. Um, but it's also easy to, it's very easy to devolve, you know? Oh, how easy. Woo. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know where we go from here. The book doesn't really present any answers for that, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah. You know, it is, it is strange. Like uh, with, just to echo what Tanana Reef said, it, uh, as far as talking about, you know, it is an interesting, as one of the, as the last episode, it kind of, it feels appropriate to talk about the podcast itself. And I felt like I knew one thing for sure going into this, and that was that I did not want to have this be a, just a rehashing of what happens in each chapter and just us talking about who our favorite characters are. I wanted this to be an in-depth analysis of the novel that was also talking about its relevancy today because it was just so weird that here I was going to be reading this book at a time when the pandemic was striking. And the reason I was reading the book, by the way, is I had started reading a few years before. I'd started reading all of King's work in chronological order. And I had read The Stand as book four, but then I had not, I'd read the original. So I was, it was time in my timeline to read the complete and uncut that came out in 1990. I just finished The Dark Half, um, 1989's The Dark Half in February. And I was thinking, how wild is it to that I have this book that I'm is sitting on my bedside now, the stand that I'm going to be reading in the middle of a pandemic. What a wild time to be reading this and how cool it would be to read it with you guys. And I, I knew that we would, I knew that there were going to be discussions about the similarities and the differences um, between the plague in the novel and the pandemic that we were experiencing. But I never experienced both, I never expected to experience both to, to Mike's uh, point and to Nana Reeve's point. I never expected for every page that we turned for it to be so relevant to what was going on in the country as we were reading it. And it's fascinating to me to think that someone might be listening to this podcast right now, five years, 10 years, 20 years into the future. And it's sort of like a time capsule that we've created that I think that constant readers will be able to return to for the next several decades. Anyone at any time can decide to read along with us. And even 20 years from now, to know what it was like to read The Stand during a time when it seemed more relevant than ever. It, the timing of how we spaced it out too is pretty remarkable. You know, it starts with the pandemic. It's bizarre. Remember, you know, Reef said like figuring out what that means and where it's going, and then you know over the summer with the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations, that's right when they're trying to figure out in the book how can we rebuild and but rebuild a better society than the one we had behind, and uh, and then you know now we've reached the end and it's like all this this crazy insurrection and. Um, 
and conspiracy nonsense and evilness in the world. But it's, you know, there was a there's a part at the very end. It, it, it used to be the original ending to the novel before he yeah. did the special edition. But it, it's such a simple thing. And I think it keys into what we were talking about. Um, you know, uh, Stuart says, Franny, do you think do you think people ever learn anything? And they're talking about, you know, radiation sickness and and nuclear bombs and the plague that was man-made and the way basically the things that humans do that sow their own destruction. And his question is, do you think people ever learn? And they're like less than one percent of the population that has survived. Like they're still asking that question, even though they've been not decimated, decimated 10 times over. Like there's almost no one left. And and they're still wondering will people learn. And I think that's kind of where we are. Is you look at the wreckage left behind, not just from this year, but what was building up to it. And not just in the past four years, but in the time long before that. Uh, we've been, this is a crescendo, you know, but the wave's been building for a while. And you just have to look back and go, all right, do people ever learn anything? And Franny's answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and I think that's our answer too. Right. <laughs> you don't know. I mean, I have some suspicions about how hard it is to change people's minds and hearts, you know, based and, and most people do if they have any experience with parents who think differently than they do, family members, you know, it's not that easy. Um, and it's humiliating and embarrassing to admit that you fell for a con man. So I think a lot of people will fight that. And, and then there's just the, I mean, not to get too deep with it, the, the changing demographics of the country are what are driving the fear and that's not going to change. So, you know, I'd, I'd read about this date when I was a kid, 2030, you know, that, that, that there would be sort of a majority minority switch. You know, that was, we were always on track for it, but in my imagination, I didn't imagine it as non-peaceful, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not going to say I, I envy the characters of the stand, but I do envy this. <laughs> I do envy how quickly people woke up on flex. Some people were already like, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna head out on our own. I'm not liking this guy's vibe. I mean, he was in my dreams and everything. He supernaturally led me here, but I, I'm not impressed. <laughs> and meanwhile, <laughs> here we have you know, contrast that to, uh, anyway. <laughs> I was thinking like just in terms of the writing of the book and the structure of the drama, um, and then this connects to what you're talking about, <clears throat> you know, the people who stay, the ones who gathered around for the execution and were wiped out by the trash can man. Like, it strikes me like uh, Mother Abigail, like she, she has her calling to leave and everybody's worried about her back in the Boulder Free Zone. And then when she comes back, that kind of saves a lot of lives, right? Because they evacuate, am I remembering right? They evacuate the meeting they're in to go see her. And that leaves Nick behind who goes and finds the bomb. Um, and he, she, so, so her arrival draws people in, if it, it saves their lives. And then the execution for Larry, like, you know, that that, um, that leads people to gather around and then they're on one place for trash can man to to nuke them <laughs> so like you know we're drawn toward the light and to the darkness um but one is your salvation and one is your destruction and i was what do you think about that just i think that's very astute yeah um and, and it's interesting because it, it's recontextualized one of one of the things i didn't like about the the book but that in that light i like a lot better um which was that if i'm larry and i look down and see that god also kind of slipped the trash can man and the nuke in mm -hmm. you know while he sent me here i'd be like really you know like <laughs> like like my last thought would just be <laughs> so i, I could have sat this one out it would have ended the same but you're right i mean that's the um that sacrificial offering is what pulls the worst elements together into one place. And I had not considered that well, uh, when, I, when I thought about that. So, and I came to that yeah. because I was thinking like, this doesn't work. Like the heroes don't do anything. They just show yeah. up and then they get destroyed. And it reminds me a little bit of Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, at the end, it's just, 
Andy and Marion tied to the post. Like they don't actually do. Yeah, it. they didn't do anything. In fact, they the outcome would have been the same, but faster if they hadn't gotten involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Indiana Jones. <laughs> If Indiana so Jones true. hadn't gotten involved, they would have flown the Ark to Berlin and it would have opened it. Yeah. And <laughs> that would have been all. King's uh, point, King's point was to illustrate how life is chaos. Do you think so? Do you think so? No, no. Actually, well, clearly. No, I mean, there are parts of the ending that, that aren't satisfying to me as well. And and I fought against actually feeling like the sacrifices were for nothing and all that kind of thing because I had made sense of them in my head in a way that you guys have now completely shredded. But um, <laughs> the part for me uh, that really stood out in the previous sections and this one is how ineffectual the dark man is when you're in his presence, you know, um, and how his greatest evil was either, uh, you know, well, you're getting into your dreams, that's pretty hardcore i gotta give him props for that but um and sending crows and wolves that's bad the wolves are, i'd much rather face the wolves <laughs> or the dark man than the wolves rather um but his his greatest acts of evil were actually perpetrated by people uh acting in his name by his followers yes. like trash can mm -hmm. man or literally by his influence, like Harold. And even though he was literally under his influence, he still was willing to step up and take more responsibility <laughs> than people were seeing today. Um, and, 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 and in terms of the bolder side, I mean, the point of it all, why? Um, uh, Do we have theories on why? Do we have theories on, the, on, on why it happens and the deus ex machina at the end and how do you, I mean, it is something that really divides a lot of constant readers. I think, I think some people just love the ending of the novel and others are very disappointed by it. So can I, can I just preface it? I know I was talking a lot, but I just, one last thing I want to say, please. um, there are two Stephen King moments that made me burst into sobs when I read them as a younger person. Uh, one was in dead zone, uh, because I hadn't let myself cry after the end of Cujo and I went right into dead zone and I just melted. And the other one <laughs> was when Stu broke his leg and got left behind on his journey to Las Vegas. And I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed because I, I was so sad and, you know, I didn't understand the twist that was coming. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, I, I can't in my core believe that those sacrifices were for nothing, nothing. Uh, that I mean, the journey means something, uh, but I'm not, I don't know. I don't know. That's all I got, guys. I, I have a theory about it. Um, and, I, and I think it's all tied to the idea of virtue. Um, and, I, and I think for me, the most powerful stand uh, is the one that Glenn takes in his final scene. And the reason I think it's so powerful is that he's directly confronted with the flag and he laughs. Kind of kind of everything Tanana Reeve just said about how the the power is in the myth and in the actions of his followers and then confronted with the actual man. Glenn's stand is to simply exercise his principles. Um, wow. And he laughs in, in his face and, wow. and, and really makes the point. It's like, you're, you're, this is, we made such a big deal out of this and it's nothing. Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's a straw God. Uh, and even then, even when he's humiliated by Glenn, Flag doesn't kill him. Flag tells Lloyd to kill him. And, and I think the, the observation there is, is really powerful. And, and I think what it does is it demonstrates that the point of the stand wasn't for them to go to Vegas to affect change in the plot. The, the point of the stand was to affect change in the people's minds who regarded Flag um, with loyalty and with awe. And the audience of that stand was Lloyd. And even though his, his decision at the end is tragic, um, you know, I think that's, that's what I think is, is, is kind of beautiful about it. And that you talk about what, a, what having a virtue really means. Um, and people say, you know, the, the simplest version is a virtue is not a virtue if it doesn't cost you anything, but that a real virtue is one you exercise without reward um, without, uh, it, it's, it's one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Who, without reward, without witness, um, 
where there's there's no benefit, there's no prize, there's no tangential reward you're going to get that's obvious to you. Um, it's simply enact this virtue of goodness or don't. And the outcome doesn't matter. And I think everyone who makes it to Vegas has to do that. And Glenn is the first, and I think the most powerful. It's it's a soaring scene, you know. Um, so I think by the time Larry's, you know, strapped up there, I think he already knows that at that point, that it, his job there wasn't to destroy Flag. His job there wasn't to burn down Vegas. His job there was to demonstrate a principle. Um, and that, to me, I think is what makes it a victory. And that's that's kind of, when you talk about can people change, who knows, but whether it's, standing up against the Nazis or standing up against the forces behind the Capitol riot, you know, whether it's standing up against systemic racism or sexism, um, whatever it is that we take our stand, like you say, you know, every month, Jason, so beautifully, it's, it's an important, what's important is that you do. And, um, King wrote so it. I, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I, I think that's that's what I take away from from their various sacrifices, and that you know Stuart is so set to be the hero, and he's he's this character you expect to be the hero, and he's going to lead the charge heroically, and it's like that's not what's expected of you, and that's not what you need to do. What he really needed to do was go back and take care of this child that is not only Franny's child but this society, um, and that you know the principled stand he was there to witness too. And he's there to see the mushroom cloud. You know, he's, he's there to kind of witness it and take it back and hope to spread that principle to other people. Um, so yeah, I, but as an atheist, I get very like a literal hand of God has to come ah. in and kind of flip the, flip the switch for us. Um, I, I thought it made perfect sense trash can man we think is an, an instrument of flag and it turns out he's an instrument of god just not in a way that he knows or understands that made perfect sense and and i would have been fully satisfied if he just drove in and he set off the bomb you know um and uh that i think the one place where i struggle with the ending is that i track all of it when whether they're acting in God's name or at God's behest or under God's influence. Um, but that is the intentional actions of human beings that drives the whole story um, on flag side and on God's side. And so the one time I felt like it cheated was when something occurred uh, that was not at the hand of a human being. And um, yeah. That's super interesting. And I, I've, I've, what you just said is something that I considered right away upon reading it this time is I realized if the trash can man had set off the atom bomb, as you said, the ending would have really been one in which evil does itself in. Yeah. And that would have made a really strong statement and a really strong moral compass for the book. But um, instead, you're right, it is the hand of God that does evil in. And in a way... What I, I I always try to I always try to justify a, an author's decision or not even an author's decision because I think the way that I could be wrong I, but I, I think the way that Stephen King writes is usually that he's surprised by things that happen in his stories he's surprised by endings of stories because they tend to kind of write themselves and just go in a direction and while it's a direction that a lot of people maybe don't look upon favorably. It does actually seem to me in many ways consistent with the rest of the novel in some ways, because, you know, you're right. There's no like there's no real reason for the hand of God to be there and to come down and do that when the trash can man could have done it other than to remind us that while there may be spokespeople for good and there may be spokespeople for evil, that there's this higher force that's always in control and the stand is a story of biblical proportions and what happens throughout the bible god intervenes god wins by default because evil cannot those were the rules in the old testament and those are the rules in the stand and something else that made it feel very consistent to me is that we've said several times in this podcast 
the lack of um while, while everyone has free will and everybody has to make it the, their own stand there are some times where it feels to us like people don't even have a choice you know nadine we've talked about as being somebody who you know was done dirty or something like that by by the author and that nadine feels very sort of like uh, at times never really had a choice harold says I was led. And Stu is a perfect example of this. Stu ends up hurting his leg and being unable to go on just so that he can survive and father Franny's child, like you said. That's not an accident. There's nothing in the stand that is an accident. And I think that people mistakenly define the stand, sometimes in the most simple of terms, as this epic battle of good versus evil, but it's also really a story about fate. That's what it is to me. And that's what, why it feels consistent to me with a lot of the other things that seem to happen throughout the story. Yes, there is good. Yes, there is evil. There is a battle between good and evil. There is free will, but also this idea just, it's a, it's a Bible story. It's a, it's very, it's a very biblical story. It's like, well, you, you know, Stephen King always preaching the word. So (laughs) Actually, that cemetery he is a yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, in that sense, uh, well, at least in this book, he is. <laughs> I yeah. would say that this book is unique. It's not that there aren't characters who believe in God in other books, but you know, um, religious zealots, as we've talked about earlier, don't do great in uh, in other Stephen King novels like Carrie. And this one does to me stand out as one that is very gaudy if that's a word, uh, in the sense of not just the supernatural dreams, but that definitive statement. Like we could draw that complete uh, human fate message, except, oh, but there is this hand of God here. So maybe Mother Abigail was right to tell these poor dudes they had to go on this trek wearing nothing but the clothes on their back and they couldn't even bring what? Food and water? It's a little excessive to me. (laughs) But- But I guess if that's what God said, you know, because that kind of stuff, that bothered me so much. I'm like, okay, I'll take the trip, but really, I can't even put on an extra coat. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, I don't know. Um, But yeah, he's making a definitive statement there. Uh, Part of it might be on a practical level, just weaving together the other religious aspects of the story, you know, from the beginning. what part of it is a statement i don't know and i wouldn't say there's so many people who say you know well he got to the end and he didn't know what to do so he just blew it all up with it and he used the hand he used deus ex machina he used the hand of god but it's like actually he totally didn't have to do that he totally could have had the trash can man just set off the atom bomb and have that be the moral compass of the story but it's not the moral compass of the story that evil does itself in well it's very strange maybe i can make a case for that 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 is what happened. There's a phenomenon, a psychological phenomenon called pareidolia. You ever heard of this? No. Okay. Uh, do you guys know the Twitter account faces in things? No. <laughs> you know, it's like a church that looks like a mouth with eyes, you know. Yeah. Okay. That looks like it's gro- like snarling. <laughs> it's where we see faces in things where there aren't. In- oh. You know, the Amityville you house. The Amityville house. Yeah. Horizontal thing and you see a face. So it's like looking at clouds and seeing shapes in the clouds, right? So I, I don't love doing this. I'm going to do it as a, I don't like it when it's a task to have to rationalize what the author does. And I think, yeah, I think this needs a, like I would give this chapter another pass, right? If I, if I were him, of course, who am I to say it's this beloved book, but I think like make the point that it's not necessarily the hand of God, but it's, it's the, um it's randall flag he's setting off like some electrical sparks right and then uh trash can man wheels in with this thing and the sparks kind of i don't know the science of it but you could make the argument that there's some sort of reaction to the radiation pouring off of this thing and the electricity that he's oh, yeah you know or the ma- even even just the magic that he's unleashed into the air and that it takes the f- shape of something that that ralph and larry perceive to be a hand uh, mm-hmm. through this psychological thing where we see shapes and things, you know? And I think like you could say, is that the hand of God? Maybe not. Maybe it's just a coincidence. That question I think is okay. I think he he leans a little too heavily into calling it the hand of God. 
but he really does just say it looks like it, just the shape of it. Yeah, the other guy, the other guy who the, one of them who looks at it, and sa- the second one who looks at it says, and it did look like, sort of like the hand of God or something like that. And that very, yeah. And that leads me back to something um, that Mike was saying about Glenn's death, you know, and he's like, you're nothing. You're really just this feeble thing. And he's laughing and he tells Glenn to shoot him. And Glenn uh, says to Lloyd, uh, well, Lloyd says to him, mister, you don't fool me. It's like Randy Flagg says. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and Glenn says, very simply, but he lies. You know he lies. Like that, to me, this whole sequence felt very of our time. That I like, mean. Here's this absurd guy who has the, you know, the tomato sauce stained Tupperware face with a little line from the all the makeup he wears, the ridiculous appearance, the stupid things he says, and people worship him. And, and it's like, but he's a liar. He's a fraud. And you guys know it. As much as you deny it, you know it. And it's really that that makes him waste Lloyd, uh, waste Glenn, you know, is because he gets to, to Lloyd and Lloyd knows he's telling the truth. And then that's when he blows him away. And, and then poor Glenn with three bullets in him props himself up and says, it's all right, Mr. Henry, you don't know any better. And like, if that's not the version of bless your heart, I don't know. <laughs> Well, also, they know not what they do. I mean, yeah. that feels like a biblical. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but I like that. I like that, Anthony. And if I could go back mm-hmm. to the end for a moment, um, because just when you want to look for a grand scheme of things with the assumption that, well, if there is a real God in this story, then surely all people are God's children. And where does Nadine fit in all this? <laughs> because yeah. this poor woman uh, did everything. She, I mean, she was teaching uh, special education. She rescued this child on the road. Uh, she, I mean, she showed people kindness. Um, and then when she finally shows up for her, her big moment, she's nothing but tortured and humiliated. There's, n- there's no even attempt at relationship for lack of a, you know, I mean, it. but that's, there are real Nadines in the world too. Uh, people who are just born into hellish lives and, and live short hellish lives uh, in the same world where, where other people don't. And, and people who believe have to try to make sense of that. And that's probably the thing that, that drives the most people away from religion is trying to figure out how can bad things then happen to good people, you know? And many, many a pastor has been asked that question and rabbi and et cetera. So it's, yeah, interesting. I think that every Dana and every Nadine and every um, Glenn, when he's laughing, uh, I think every time someone humiliates him or surprises him or does something to piss him off, I think it kills him a little bit more inside. And I think that it weakens his powers. He also is getting to a point where he can't see things like he used to see things. He can't do things like he used to do things. I think Nadine, even the, ends up being an instrument of the hand of God. I think she ends up being something that, um, by, you know, chucking herself out that window, um, it kills a piece. It kills his son. It kills a piece of him, and it uh, it weakens him. It weakens his powers. Justice for Nadine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After all the absolutely terrible things that she's done. True. We talk, we True. talk a lot about the allusions to um, Randall between Randall Flagg and Donald Trump, but I also was thinking, like, I was trying to consider, okay. Who is the who is the Donald Trump in this story? And definitely there are parallels between him and Randall Flagg. But also in real life, I think Donald Trump is the trash can man. Because if you look at what he has done to these far right people who were there before him, who may be there after him, but maybe not, because he has he has decimated that party. He has made it all about himself. He's blown it up. And now uh, with his uh, not very graceful downfall it's it's really shattered that movement and then you look we won georgia huh that's great news i'm I'm not five minutes before it got knocked out of the news cycle oh my gosh (laughs) yeah and i honestly think like it's partly 
like he really woke a lot of people up right on the on the good side of things and made them realize you can't be passive you can't be passively good you have to be actively good make your stand and so maybe he's the trash can man you know who delivers the the uh the destructive device to the uh to the to the dark gathering well it is almost as if um he was the zombie who who bit members of the party you know to the point where on the day of a historic insurrection at the capitol that ended up taking the life of a police officer Mm -hmm. still more than 140 representatives are willing to stand up and and publicly like with their faces uncovered and their names known (laughs) try to dispute election results that are sterling I, and have withstood, you know, legal challenge after legal challenge, uh, record numbers of voters in some places, and to, and uh, most of them doing it knowingly, knowing it's not true. Oh uh, yeah, my congressman was one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just and so wow, that it is. And, it's like an infection passing through the party. Maybe when he's well, gone, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll maybe it'll leave a uh, that'll be a wake up call for some of those folks. I don't know. I, I think it's very interesting that in, in light of kind of what we were talking about last week with the one star reviews that pop up because of conversations like this, I, I think it's it's very fascinating to me that a book like this, you know, and, and what makes for great enduring fiction is is that you can and should be able to look at it and apply it, use it as this distorted mirror to reality and apply it to to your world and learn from it and and try to extract lessons from what's happening in your life. And I just love the idea that there are people out there who are going to be listening to conversations like we're having and say, oh, like, fuck you guys. You took this simple book about a global pandemic and about uh, a psychotic liar who rose to power and factionalized, you know, what was left of the United States into a near civil war. And you had to go and politicize it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and it's like, you know, how how is it that people can claim to enjoy just the fiction of something like this? How obtuse must you be to deny to yourself the appropriate connections to the reality that's unfolding in front of you? And 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 I think that's going to be, as we undoubtedly wrap, rack up a you know. A whole new pile of one star. <laughs> I, 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 um, I just, it's, it's one of those things where, like, we not like the four of us got together at the beginning of this and ever had a conversation about our politics. Never. Ever had a never. conversation about wanting to never. infuse them into the show. I, and I think never. we all, never once. And, and like, we all approached this as fans of Stephen King. Who said, Oh, you know, it actually, while we have the time, because who knows how long we'll be at home or alive, wouldn't it be fun to do this? Yeah, wouldn't wouldn't it be a neat opportunity to to do a book club? And the fact <laughs> that it's it's led us to undeniably, you know, uh political insights, I, I think is not something that I, I think any of us should be uh should should or be expected to apologize for. And <laughs> and I think that's really I, I could not agree more with what uh, with what you're saying, and I love. Um, I would so much prefer to think of Donald Trump, um, and so many of the of the people who have been empowered by him, as the trash can man, and not as Randall Flag. I I prefer that analogy, in fact, and it had never occurred to me, and I'm grateful that it's in my brain now. Uh, so thank you for that, Mr. Bresnikan. Um, I. I think it's going to be really fascinating as, you know, as, as we look into the world where, you know, the Senate didn't convict Randall Flagg and so he's free to run for office at the end and dies. <laughs> you know, we have this, we have this Randall Flagg 2024 epilogue uh, at the end of the stand. Um, and as we all kind of ride out whatever the hell is going to happen in the next calendar week, much less yeah. month, much less year, you know, um, I wonder if people can change and I wonder what kind of lessons all of us um, from whatever walks of life and whatever our belief systems are before we approach our day-to-day lives, much less our entertainment, what lessons we're willing to extract, what truths we're willing to look at. And I think that's what makes the stand so powerful is it's all, there's so much in there that we, the author defies us to look at. And um, 
and here it is playing out right in front of us. It's, it's, I think that's what makes it a masterpiece of American literature. I couldn't agree more. The fact, the fact that it is so relevant, the fact that it remains relevant, the fact that it, you know, it, it stands that test of time is something that really does make it um, one of the greatest American novels, um, as your wife said, Mike, um, when she was on the show. It really, really is. And um, it, it's, uh, I think that it will continue to stand the test of time. I think that if we all, here's an idea. I think if we all got together 20 years from now and did this again, <laughs> hopefully not quite as relevant 20 years oh from gosh. now, hopefully not quite as, maybe there'll be a little more enjoyment and fun and an escapist hook in it. Um, but uh, it, it's a great, it's a great work of literature for, you're absolutely right. And I think there is something, of course, really on the nose relevant uh, in that question uh, that Lloyd had to grapple with at the end. And I think any of our listeners or viewers who want so badly not to hate us right now and are looking for a way <laughs> to understand how we can even see the world the way we do, ask the question, what if he really is a liar? What if it really is lies? You know, I think that's where it starts. What if what if he was really a liar and and look for the the different ways that he has been demonstrably a liar in the past and that unlocks all the keys. And in terms of who is Randall Flagg, I think Randall Flagg is that part of all the human nature that we all have. Uh, and the same for Mother Abigail. Amen. You know, I Amen. mean, there Larry struggled with whether he was one of the good guys. Um yeah poor uh oh my god harold you know poor harold the murderer the the terrorist but poor harold uh, struggled and it could have gone either way you know but for this or but for that nadine but for this or but for that so it's those you know when you look at the the bios of the people who've been arrested in the wake of the insurrection it's not the the stereotypes that that the media likes to talk about it's it's not economically challenged people um many successful people uh people who are moms and who work at schools and you know they're they're all of us but they're looking at the world in a very different way and and that is where the randall flag and the mother abigail part of the story come in that's beautifully said i, I and I, I think the that that notion that the the only difference between the good and bad characters in the stand is what they do right yeah the, the the difference between larry and harold um isn't in who they are at the beginning it's in the choices that they make and the actions that they that they take and it's that that beautiful old saying of you know the the difference between who you are and who you want to be is very simple and it's what you do mm. and um by by their actions you will know them you know uh, the other great biblical uh Point that I'm sure King is, you know, hammering into this. Um, and I think that's a, that's a beautiful point. Is that, you know, everybody at Boulder isn't there because they're inherently good, and everybody in Vegas isn't there because they're inherently bad. They're all human beings who made their decisions, and sometimes they changed those. They changed their minds. Yeah. People yeah. left Vegas and went to went to Boulder, and yeah. vice versa. Yeah. You know. Um, and, and I think that's a beautiful facet of this story too, is that, you know, everyone's fate is determined by their actions. Um, but what a beautiful intenting idea that those actions are orchestrated by something sentient and bigger that has mm -hmm. a plan, you know? Um, and I think that's, therein is the understandable and beautiful mystique of religion. Um, so I think it all kind of going to work. Yeah. It's my, this might seem like a silly question to ask considering that we've been talking about it for six episodes, but I, I, you know, obviously like when I think of, um, when I think of Stephen King's it, when somebody asks me, what is Stephen King's it about? I can name like 12 things that Stephen King's it is about, you know, but at the end of the day, there's, I mean, it, uh, Stephen King's it is about, you know, racism and misogyny and child abuse and i mean there's just a hundred things that that book is about but at the end of the day for me probably like the big thing that it's about is um the bridge that we walk from childhood to adulthood and the monsters that we have to face to get to the other side of that bridge um but i i i so although we've talked a lot about the many things that the stand is about um and in fact I remember asking this question to Mick Garris, asking him, you know, 
what is the sand about to you? Like if the sand is about one thing in particular, what's the deeper meaning of the sand and what is it about to you? Mick Garris told me that for him it was about America, that it was about the American dream and and love of being a patriot and wanting to bring that back and, and all of that. So I think it's a very different question for, I think it's an individual question. So I'd like to ask each of you, what is for you the deeper meaning of the stand and, and that can be answered the answer to that can be what the stand is really about for you um anthony i would say for me it's about that thing that larry that larry's one night stand yells at him you ain't a, you ain't a nice guy mm. and characters who are striving to prove that that assessment is not true and some, of course, you know, on the other side who are verifying that it's true. But this, to me, he's a character who is, has messed up and has um, is on a self-destructive path. And there's nothing more hopeful than a character who veers off of that. You, you know, we all know them in our own lives, people who've struggled with addiction or um, maybe it's illness or maybe it's just bad upbringing and things that they learned and those people who chart a course to say it's going to be different with me i'm going to be different even if they're even if, you know they they have a lot to be sorry for um i like the idea that this is a book that shows you can make a new beginning like that line do people ever learn i think the answer is yes i think they do learn Sometimes they have to learn more than once, <laughs> but, they, uh, uh, but they can, especially if they want to. And, um, you know, I hope if there's something that our society grapples with over the, in the coming year and, and beyond is, is with uh, how do you forgive those people who, uh, who like Nadine are trying to get right, you know, and not uh, push them away so that they become radicalized and how, how do you turn Nadine's into Larry's so that's what it's about for me is figuring out who you are and who what you really believe and um and uh and having the chance to prove it beautiful beautifully said Tanana Reeve yeah I guess I'll just piggyback on on both that response and also what you said the previous one was it's a it's a great metaphor for the United States of America right now <laughs> that's for sure but hand in hand with that is this element of personal agency and the decisions that we make. And sure, it's easy to be uh, a generous person or feel like you're a generous person until you feel that you don't have anything you can give or that it's somehow a threat to you to give or you don't feel safe anymore in giving. Um, people's views tend to get more and more conservative as they get older, not universally, but tend to, because we become more and more fearful as we get older. Uh, we're more fragile, we're, and, and fear has driven so much of what we're seeing right now in politics of the United States. So it's that overall national metaphor, but also who are you really? Who are you really? Um, make your personal stand, decide who you are and do something because it, it's, an, it's an active process. It's like Anthony said about voting. It's not a passive process. <laughs> so you may feel like you are a coward, but if you stand up, you are actually more heroic than, than you believe you are. So we have to fight with our, our self image and, and who we can really be. Mike? I, I wanna just yes and both of those answers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I. I uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting. We're all we're all getting a lot of the same things out of out of this huge dense story, and I think that that says a lot as well. But yeah, I, I think for me, the stand is about the fact that in each of us there's a pull toward the light and a pull toward the dark, and our our better and our worse natures. And in each of us as individuals, that's true. And society uh culture that's that's true the human race that's true um and i think it's about how we may think we want to be the good guys we want to we want to represent the good side 
we aren't most of us the overwhelming majority of us are not going to be called to lead an army or fight a battle or topple a regime we're going to be called to make small choices in conversation and in our interactions as individuals and in where we put our resources and to whom we give our money and platform and all these seemingly small things that all add up to our part in making a stand for something that is good um, for the better the better nature of people and that the point of that stand and the reward that would come from that stand may not come to us and we may never see it. Um, but we need to make that stand anyway. And, and I think that's what the book's about. It's, it's an instruction manual for how to be that force of good, even if you yourself don't feel that you deserve it or that, that you are as good as your cause. Um, and yeah, I, I think beyond that, it's, it has tendrils into truth in so many different directions. Um, but that's what it is for me at the heart of it is, is the, what, what every good parable should be um, a demonstration into how to do the right thing. Mm. Even if it's going to be in a tiny private moment that we think won't matter. Mm. I love it. You guys are all so beautiful. You guys are just the best. You all have such like, you're also eloquent in the way that you, I, I would have to, I would have to yes and all three of you. Um, and in fact, I don't even know if there's anything that I could, could say that would be anywhere um, near more eloquent. Um, I did want to, to, um, I know Anthony had read just a part of it, um, a couple lines from it, but for me, I think that um, the heart of the stand, the sand, like I said, it's about a million different things. The sand is about a whole lot of different things that we've talked about over the last six episodes. But I think if I had to boil it down to one thing, it would be what's really at the end of the novel. And um, Anthony did read a couple lines from it, but I wanted to read the whole thing since it's uh, just the just the last, uh, it's about a half page here um, because it is the last episode and I just think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of writing in, in the whole book um, all any of us can buy is time Stu thought Peter's lifetime his children's lifetime maybe the lifetimes of my great-grandchildren until the year 2100 maybe surely no longer than that maybe not that long time enough for poor old mother earth to recycle herself a little a season of rest what? she asked, and he realized he had murmured it aloud. A season of rest, he repeated. What's that mean? Everything, he said, and took her hand. Looking down at Peter, he thought, maybe if we tell him what happened, he'll tell his own children. Warn them. Dear children, these toys are death. Their flash burns and radiation sickness and black choking plague. These toys are dangerous. The devil in men's brains guided the hands of God when they were made. Don't play with these toys, dear children, please. Not ever, not ever again, please. Please learn the lesson. Let this empty world be your copybook. Franny? he said, and turned her around so he could look into her eyes. What, Stuart? Do you think... Do you think people ever learn anything? She opened her mouth to speak, hesitated, fell silent. The kerosene lamp flickered. Her eyes seemed very blue. I don't know, she said at last. She seemed unpleased with her answer. She struggled to say something more, to illuminate her first response, and could only say it again. I don't know. So, I think, like all great stories, 
the stand ultimately holds up a mirror to its readers. As Mike mentioned, it shows them the dark side of themselves and it shows them the inherently good side of themselves. And as Anthony said and Tanara Reef said, it leaves them with a single question. Do we learn from our mistakes? And as we sit here on January 17th, 2021, days after a vicious attack on our nation's capital and days before a new chapter begins, when a new administration will be inaugurated. We are in a time of great turmoil, but we are also in a time of great hope. We hold tight to that hope in belief that a change is going to come. And so I ask each of you on the final episode, Anthony already answered the question, he jumped ahead, but um, I have to ask each of you on the final episode the same question that Stu asks of Franny. Do you think people ever learn anything well we only need enough people to learn (laughs) that's the key you know some people won't uh some people have things that are more critical to them to cling to than actual reality you know out of fearfulness or whatever the reasons but Young people can learn. They don't always either. It depends on where they're picking up their lessons, but young people can learn. And, and yeah, I think some people do wake up from, from a dream and, and are willing to unify. Uh, But I'm a little wary of that word unification. (laughs) So right now I'm more interested in getting the ship's course righted, making sure competent, intelligent people are back at the helm uh, and, and trying to, to not only undo the mess, but, but create something better. Beautifully put. I, um, I hope, I, I guess, yeah, I join you guys in hoping people learn. I, I don't know. I feel like our, our capacity for wisdom and our capacity for ignorance are in a constant race and they kind of advance in proportion to each other and there there always feels like there's this awful equilibrium where we take a a huge step forward you know and i think about i I think about barack obama's inauguration and and what that looked like and and what that felt like and then and then there's there's a there's there's this reaction it's like we, we take these steps and then there's an echo. There, there's a, a call and response in our progress as human beings. And, and I think our, our drives to better ourselves and our drives to destroy ourselves are just in this constant kind of game of inches. And I don't know if people learn or if, if, if we do that we, we learn one thing and and it leaves us vulnerable to this whole other thing that, that comes roaring up from the sides. I, I, I'm hopeful though, because I, I do know that we have as a species made enormous progress in our admittedly cosmically brief time of you know, sentient existence on, on earth. Um, we, you can't argue that the world isn't so much better for so many people today than it was 2000 years ago, right? It's just that the progress is so fucking slow and the cost is so fucking high. And for all of the, these beacons of hope that kind of pop up and these human beings that show up and they take an amazing stand and they change the world and they teach people, they change their minds on a huge scale. For every one of them, you know, this fucking demon also pops up and is elevated to the same level, if not higher. Um, And we have these glowing, you know, incredible human beings that single-handedly move the the cause forward. And more often than not, we kill them. Um, You know, it's, it's, I I, I hope we learn. Um, God, I hope we learn from this year. And I'm skeptical that we will. You know, I, I really hope as I look, I've, I've got three kids and my youngest is two years old and everything she greets in the world, she greets with joy, everything. Um, she does not have a concept 
that anything in in her world wishes her harm and that really weighs heavy on me when i watch her when i watch them um and it makes me very hopeful that god damn i hope i hope people can learn and change for their sake and i keep saying to my my sons they don't even understand it sometimes i'm like god i hope you fix this um i hope i hope you play a part in fixing this and i'm sorry for the world we're handing you you know like we should have done a lot better but people are slow to fucking learn um myself included so yeah um yeah i hope so and i think that's something about all of the stephen king work uh that i think i've heard each one of the three of you individually over the course of this call out the same thing is that i, I think people that love his work love it because they're people who want hope um the people who who kind of roll their eyes at a lot of king fiction and say like oh these sappy king endings and stuff and it's like no it's it's that he has love and hope and optimism and empathy in his heart and that's why so many of his horrific stories end on those notes he knows more than than most how important that is in a world of horror and i think the people that love him respond to that so i i think for as realistic as we need to be and as much as we have to be Glenn's in this world, you know, I think the four of us, as I understand you guys, are also optimists, um, informed optimists, but <laughs> optimists at heart. And, and I, I hope, I hope. You know, yeah, we're gonna end this. Uh, I, like for me, it's like, it, oh, oh, we're gonna end on Shawshank Redemption. Yes, it's, it's uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. um it's if if there is a hand of fate and there is a, a hand of God in this world, perhaps the free will that we have is the free will to learn from our mistakes and to um do that really on an individual level because there's really no other way that it can be done. You know, the there's a whole lot of people who wanna change the world. And the only way to change the world is to change what's looking back at you in the mirror. It's you can't change other people. You can only change yourself. You can only lead by example. You can only um, work on transforming the parts of yourself that are flag and work on transforming them into Mother Abigail uh, to the best of, of your ability. And in doing so, you create a better world. Um, it's a that one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Rav Berg, who says, you can't have a better world without better people in it. So, um, and that's a, it's a, it's a constant, it's a life's work. It's a, it's a constant learning. And I, that's, for me, that's what hit me about the end of the novel was the thought that it's not, it's not just global, it's individual, it's not just political, it's personal, it's, it's, do we learn? Do we learn? And maybe that's like the part, if this is the Bible, if this is King's version of the Bible, maybe that's the purpose of life, you know? Do we learn? Do we learn from our mistakes? Do we grow from them? Um, we have a, uh, there's a um, second ending to the book in the uncut version where um, Randall Flagg ends up on a on an island somewhere with some natives. Um, I just, I was curious if anyone had any feelings about whether they preferred the ending that ends at Franny's line, I don't know, or whether, it, to me, it felt like a bonus. It felt like it could be like a deleted scene, um, <laughs> this sort of added ending with a uh, flag on the island, but just to end on a slightly more, um, slightly less gravity pulling note. Any thoughts on, on Randall Flagg's uh, island? We're better off without it. You think so? <laughs> I forgot about it actually. That was really to be honest, so. It, it, feels like, it feels like the original ending to the novel is pretty, it's pretty, it's perfect to end it on I don't know, it's just. It's totally perfect. I don't know where he is. Is he in another world? Is it like a world before the rise of civilization? Is it? <clears throat> is he just on some island that's secluded? Is it a Dark Tower tie-in? Does he show up later? I don't know. I, I haven't it. read them all. I haven't read them all yet. He yeah. needs to come back with more game next time. Yeah. 
place before civilization, Mike? Mm. I, I thought it was Dark Tower. I, I thought it was the, you know, there are other worlds than these, and he yeah, kind of struck out in this one, so he's off to the next one, but he's he's starting earlier, yeah. kind of in the in the grand scheme of things. And um and he is such a critical kind of character in in the Dark Tower that it, it just felt to me like he was on a different spoke of the wheel, as they say. Um but uh I I do think though that the original ending in this case is perfect and hits the message in the heart of it. And it's interesting because the, you know, the end of the dark tower has a similar kind of thing where there's a beautiful ending. And then he even breaks the wall and says, Hey, you should probably stop reading there. That's the best ending. However, there's something else. If you want to go, there's one more scene. And of course you go. And, and of course it, it's got that same sense of cyclical resumption. And, um, so I think it's very king. I think it's neat that it's here. Uh, I, I, I love having it all, but I really, I really loved the ending with with Fran, and that was too. I think that, in my heart, will be the end of the story. I couldn't agree more. Mike, Tanara Reeve, Anthony, thank you for joining me. Next month, we'll be discussing chapters one through thirteen of Stephen King's It. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think we're all podcasted out for a minute. Yeah. You did think we were going to get together in 25 years to read it. I think it's 20 years. To 20. Be we'll, context, we'll be in our, our personal contamination pods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, slurping by Soil and Green. We'll be critiquing the actions of President Kylie Jenner. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, where will we be 20 years from now? Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. You can find links to bonus podcast episodes, to Nana Reeve Dew's online course, uh, Anthony Bresnikin's articles for Vanity Fair, and much more at thestandpodcast.com. And as we close today's episode... The Stand asks you to take a stand, whether it is to the Red Cross or to the EMS FDNY Help Fund, which you can find a link to on thestandpodcast.com. Find a charity that is helping people in the middle of this pandemic. Find a way that you can make your stand on the side of the good and donate whatever you can to help those who are suffering from COVID-19 in the middle of this pandemic. And if you're listening to this podcast far into the future, I ask you to do the same thing. Find those less fortunate than you and make your stand on the side of the good. And the side of the good is uh, very easily defined from the side of evil. To stand on the side of good, one only needs to be willing to share with an open heart and an open hand. So look for the opportunities for kindness. Look for the opportunities to share make this stand your life's work and until we meet again remember the place where you make your stand doesn't matter only that you do and that you're still on your feet <laughs>